I ordered an e-reader with an extra large font. I think I'm going to need to buy a bigger case. Never mind the function, feel the form. This week on Click, we'll look at some of the device designs that we could find in our hands, our homes, and on our roads in the next decade. But whatever we touch, we definitely will leave our mark. We're with the police force using the latest technology to get much more from the scene of the crime. And if you really want to make that mark, why not use it to build an electronic circuit with some rather unusual paint? We'll also have a trip inside the world of the Game of Thrones, courtesy of virtual reality. All that plus the latest tech news and a chat about chat in Webscape. Welcome to Click. I'm Spencer Kelly and welcome to the Design Museum in London for an exhibition showcasing the finalists of the Design of the Year Award. There are plenty of weird and wonderful creations here, including a machine which reads text sent it into a website and prints it out using good old pen and paper. And that is a theme that we're seeing amongst some of the exhibits this year, this merging of digital with good old analog. Take this Lego calendar, for example. Yes, that's right, Lego calendar. You arrange your team's time using real coloured blocks, but then, if you take a photo of it, an app analyses the image and syncs it with your digital schedule. Talking of blocks, here's a concept smartphone where the components are swappable and upgradable. Want more memory or a better camera? Well, just plug it in. And then there's the iExam smartphone app that should help prevent the onset of blindness in the developing world. These awards are all about selecting products that take a fresh look at existing problems and then solve them in a better or at least a unique way. Ever got the feeling you weren't getting enough from your piano? Well, this one has gel keys to help your fingers feel something closer to the sound that they produce. Hmm, sounds like chopsticks, feels like jelly. Mmm, squidgy. And more from the Design Awards a bit later, but now we turn our attention to crime, and specifically, solving it. For more than 100 years, one of the main methods to catching criminals has been the fingerprints. And although this is a fairly rudimentary technique, scientists are now hauling it into the 21st century. Rebecca Morell has been finding out how mass spectrometry can tell you much more about the owner of a set of prints than just who they are. As the night draws in, criminals start to go to work. And so too do West Yorkshire's crime scene investigators. XO Mike 2 to Alpha. Yeah, if you can show me his code 5 to log 538, please. A break in nearby has been reported, and Chris Barley is on his way to investigate. The burglars have forced their way into the house, and it's upstairs where they've caused the most damage. We believe that the suspects were probably looking for jewellery, that kind of thing. But they have torn open every drawer, suitcases have been opened, cupboards, contents thrown out. So we've had a very messy search. Amongst the chaos, it's the CSI officer's job to find any clues that the suspects have left behind. And finding a fingerprint could be the key to cracking this case. So in just this strand of bed, there's two mobile phones. It's quite possible. They've been handled, they've seen the model. This place has been completely ransacked and the CSI team behind me are searching for any scraps of evidence that they can find. But despite all the advances in technology, central really for the last 100 years has been the fingerprint for identifying suspects. But a new technology promises to bring this to a whole new level. These scientists from Sheffield Hallam University have joined forces with the police in the first trial of its kind. They say a fingerprint reveals far more than just a person's identity. It can provide vital clues about the suspect's activities hours before the crime took place. The samples are analysed here in the lab. They're looking for any trace, no matter how small, of substances hidden within or on the prints. They use a technique called mass spectroscopy. 
It helps them to find out what these chemicals are by seeing how they behave when they're fired through a magnetic field. To make it easier, let's imagine we have a ping pong ball, a football and a cannonball, and that the field is a steady stream of wind. If you throw the ping pong ball, the gust will have a big effect on its path through the air. The heavier football's journey is less affected, and the cannonball is pretty tough to move. By studying how these balls travel and where they end up can tell you a lot about what the objects are. And it's the same for molecules and atoms. This was a, a crime scene mark found on a laptop, and so we analysed it and this is a software that enables you to see the molecules distributed on this particular mark. And what we think it is here is cocaine because the weight, or the mass to charge more technically, would correspond to that presented by cocaine. We can distinguish uh, males from females or we can understand whether or not a person has dealt drugs or actually taken drugs. We can detect ingested substances, so we may be able to reconstruct what that person has been eating just before um, committing the crime. Back on the road and the forensic squad have been called to another break-in. This time a television has been stolen. More prints have been left, helping the team to build a profile of the person that's committed this crime. We've got to use all the tools at our disposal to try and identify and solve crime. Um, criminals are getting better at doing what they do and we need to keep up with them. And this is just one way that we might improve the way that we can use fingerprints and ultimately um, prevent and detect crime. The calls from Police HQ keep flooding in. The work is never done and any new tools for this CSI team will of course be most welcome to help with their ongoing fight against crime. Rebecca Morell. So at the sharp end, spectrometry can be used to detect fine details and chemical traces in things like a fingerprint. But just because you're not a member of the team at CSI West Yorkshire doesn't mean you can't do a spot of analysis on your own at home. In this envelope is one of the nominations here at the Designs of the Year exhibition, and it is a do-it-yourself spectrometer for your smartphone. Step one, take out, fold up, and stick together the pre-made template, or you can download the PDF and print one for yourself. Note the slit, very important. Step two, vandalize a DVD. Taking just the transparent layer, you can create a quick and dirty diffraction grating. Perfect for splitting light into its constituent parts. Step three, stick the whole thing onto your phone's camera, point it at a light or shine a light through something and you'll get a spectral fingerprint that's unique to its chemistry. Now, this was developed to help identify environmental pollutants, which means step four, where you upload the image to the online spectral workbench, will then attempt to analyze the object's chemical composition and spot contaminants like crude oil. How illuminating, chemically speaking, at least. OK, next up, a look at this week's tech news. Another month, another shopping splurge. Facebook has announced that it will buy Oculus VR, a startup specialising in virtual reality headsets for a cool $2 billion. But not everyone's happy about the Kickstarter success selling to Facebook. Minecraft creator Marcus Pearson donated to the kit's development back in 2012, alongside more than 9,000 other crowdfunders. Following the news, Pearson cancelled plans to create a special VR version of his game, saying that Facebook creeps him out. The US Department of Justice has made the first convictions against distributors of pirated mobile apps. The two Americans have pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit criminal copyright infringement in the case that involves more than one million downloads worth more than $700,000. The App Bucket Group offered its own version of the Android Marketplace which could be installed on a user's smartphone until it was seized in 2012. Apple has said it wants more ethnic diversity in the basic range of text messaging emoji icons. While dozens of icons appear to show white faces, only two are specifically Asian and none are black. The icons are based on a standard list agreed by a consortium of tech companies. Previous petitions have lobbied for the addition of everything from hot dogs to tacos. 
And for tech-savvy fashionistas, one company, Iconomy, has developed a smart mannequin that can tell you what it's wearing via a transmitter and an app. Inside the model is the so-called VM beacon, which works even when the store is closed. Shoppers who've opted into the system are given the must-have item's location in-store or a link to the online shop if they can't be bothered to carry the bags home. You know, one of the reasons I never do any gardening is because I can't use my tablet while I'm wearing the heavy-duty gloves. See, touch screen doesn't work. But fortunately, my azaleas need suffer no more because I've discovered this. It's a tube of conductive paint. And what you do is just slap a dollop on each fingertip like that. Whip out your hairdryer and give it a couple of minutes. And then the magic should happen. Now, this is not the only use for this kind of paint. In fact, it could have some pretty serious implications for the future of electronics. Dan Simmons has been getting hands-on and hands-off again with some of the latest inky innovations. Getting kids interested in the classroom can be a tricky business, but to be able to paint instruments and then play them, well, that suddenly makes things much more fun. By hooking up painted circuits to a single Arduino board and speaker, a range of instruments can be created. And you don't even have to touch it to play it. Now, each of these circles has its own electromagnetic field. And when my hand comes close enough to each one, well, it breaks that and sends a signal back to the circuit board. And that then plays the appropriate sound. This prototype only plays certain MP3 sounds all at the same volume. But by turning the paint into a sensor, the different levels of resistance can be measured. So you could alter each note's volume or pitch. You've got to remember to take your hands away. The company behind the paint, Bear Conductive, says music isn't its only forte. It could also be fine-tuned for interactive books, doorbells, hidden sensors and everyday light switches. These could be covered with wallpaper or painted over with regular paint so you don't even have to see them. One of the exciting things is giving it to a much larger or wider audience and they come back saying, oh actually it's really amazing for this application or I really want to make this book or a poster or something else that you know we'd never think of because one we're doing other things but also it's just collective brain power get effectively. You do need to wait for each circuit that you've painted to dry before you can test it out. Painted circuits is all well and good for amateur enthusiasts, but for professional engineers, much faster and more precise use of conductive ink is being investigated. At the University of Tokyo, researchers are using desktop printers to do something similar, which they say could revolutionise the electronics industry. Traditionally, in a lab, prototype circuit boards are sent for sintering and take a number of days before being returned for testing. But Professor Kawahara and his team have printed out working flexible circuit boards in a matter of seconds, using just photo paper and a special ink that contains silver. The fact that all this is flexible and can simply be printed and folded means that we could create our own 3D objects using a 3D printer and put those paper circuits inside so they can be a little bit more interesting. Here's a torch that we made. And sensors, this one, for example, has an antenna built in and this detects how much rain is falling on it. These could be perhaps planted across an entire field, hundreds of them, and then they biodegrade so they wouldn't be around after they were needed. Once the circuits are printed, the electrical components, like a battery or LED light, can be attached by hand. It's fiddly and takes a while. And that could be a problem for more complex prototypes. So this research has been taken further by Microsoft's R&D centre in Cambridge. 
These stickers make things easy by combining components with adhesive to cut down production time. The simple and instant fusion of stickers with the circuits means that components can be easily recycled, perfect for prototyping. Making electronics this simple could lead to a new era of product creation. You can um, print out the functionality, a working circuit, print out the form factor and combine the two. So you can imagine in the future there being a machine, a printing machine, which actually prints working devices. It doesn't just print you know, empty shelves of Space Invaders, but it prints maybe a Space Invader with some interactivity. Whilst of course you can buy electronic devices that have already been imagined from the high street, these new DIY circuits open the door to anyone with a printer to create simple gadgets unique to each of us. Dan Simmons there, always on the lookout for new toys. Now, as we heard earlier, the big news story of the week has centred on Facebook's purchase of virtual reality company Oculus. And it's certainly left a lot of people wondering what the future of VR might be. In the past, we've associated it mainly with gaming, but virtual reality could change the way that we view other forms of entertainment, like TV and movies too. As LJ Rich experienced recently in Texas, or should that be on the north wall of the Kingdom of Westeros? This is a virtual experience that promises to put viewers into one of the world's most popular television shows. The Oculus Rift visor allows you to see what many characters in the show would see, and there's even a wind machine to create the breeze that you would experience if you were to look over the Seven Kingdoms. Facebook says its acquisition of Oculus will change the way we work, play and communicate but I don't like strangers poking me in the real world, let alone the virtual one. I found the whole thing rather convincing. Not surprising, really, as it's backed up by some serious processing grunt from the same company who produced the Oscar-winning effect in Gravity. We've literally got ridiculous-sized power machines that we've custom-made, 3.3 gigahertz monsters feeding each machine. You're seeing stuff being rendered at 4K at 60 frames per second, so you've no sort of latency at all as you look around, which makes it super smooth. Now, given the average life expectancy of a character in Game of Thrones, it's no wonder the experience is quite short. And even though you follow a selected path rather than explore the world freely, it's impossible not to feel impressed at this simulated world, particularly when looking over a cliff edge that drops 700 feet. I feel like I'm just on a tiny platform at the, at the top of a cliff. It's, it's quite vertiginous, even though I know this isn't real. It is a little worrying. It's quite an odd experience because, of course, I know that I'm not ascending the wall at Westeros. The kind of feedback that you're getting from at least three of your senses feels pretty real. It's cold, it's sort of rattly, and you're, you're looking at something in 3D. I'm, I'm glad I've done it. Don't think I want to do it again. Though. Now the thing is, we take this to directors that we work with in the film world and say, "Fill your boots. You know, this is this is for you to write now. This is uh, it's a whole new set of tools about non-linear storytelling for you to learn." And then I don't think we're too far away from starting a project where it'll be a properly led film directorial effort. LJ Rich, and despite what you may think, winter is coming. That's a Game of Thrones reference, although a bit pirate if you ask me, but never mind. Anyway, Facebook isn't just buying goggles. It also recently forked out $19 billion for the instant messaging app WhatsApp. But which chat client is best for you? That's one of the big topics of the year so far, and here's Kate Russell with her thoughts in Webscape. With so many chat apps vying for your attention, how do you choose the right one? You'll obviously be swayed by how many of your contacts you can reach with the platform, and smart voicemail service Libon just added open chat to its free apps, which lets users send text messages, pictures, audio, location data and more to any of their contacts, no matter what messaging service they use. Did you get my text? 
This open system has the big bonus that your contacts won't be plagued by sign-up requests from the service in order for you to message them. They can even see it in a web browser if they don't have a smartphone. For contacts also using Libon, you'll get free HD voice calls on 3 and 4G and wireless. Although do remember, your service provider might charge you for data when not on Wi-Fi. There are so many other options in this space we could be here all day, so I'll just pick out the highlights. With Facebook forking out over $19 billion for it recently, WhatsApp has to get a mention. It lets users send free text, image, voice, video and location data to other WhatsApp users. As with all of these app-to-app -app services, it'll trawl through your contacts to identify people you can connect with when you first install it. The king of the multimedia chat apps in Asia is WeChat with around 250 million users. Again, free on all leading platforms with similar features to WhatsApp, but including voice and video calls already. This app also uses QR codes to add contacts and set up group chats, which is an important feature for those writing in Chinese-style languages, which use thousands of characters rather than the Latin alphabet the Western QWERTY keyboard is optimised for. Another popular cross-platform service is Kik, with features similar to WhatsApp and WeChat. One big difference, though, is that you don't need to share your personal details to send a message, like phone number or email address. Instead, you create a username, so it's perfect for connecting with people you might not want to be in contact with forever, like on holiday or through a dating site. For an alternative in the private messaging lineup, there is also BBM, now available on iOS and Android, as well as BlackBerry handsets. And you share a PIN number rather than your personal information. As well as the privacy benefits, you might also find a lot of your friends are using this app, as it had over 75 million users before BlackBerry ran into troubles a few years ago. If you are a total privacy freak, then Telegram Messenger is one app that's been gaining a lot of traction lately. Messages between users are free and private, and because of the distributed server setup, they're fast too. A secret message to you. It's early days for this app, so only the iOS and Android versions are official, and the likelihood is none of your contacts will be on it yet. But as it is an open API project, meaning the source code to build compatible apps and add-ons is freely available for other developers, there are a lot of unofficial builds coming online for other smartphones and even a desktop client. You can also initiate a secret chat, which heavily encrypts messages user to user with a unique key to avoid interception by hackers or government snoops and prevents the other chatter from forwarding messages. Me Thanks for those wise messages, Kate, and you will find all of those links at our website as normal, bbc.co.uk slash click, along with various bits of this week's programme and your regularly updated feast of tech news. And if you'd like to get in touch with us on the email, we're click at bbc.co.uk and on Twitter, we live at BBC Click. That's it for now, though. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.